Hey everyone, welcome back to the Career Matters Podcast. This is your host, Nisar Ahmed. This is episode 114 of the Career Matters Podcast. And in this particular episode, we are looking at the freelance career landscape. So you can call it the Freelance Career Expert Series. And we have a guest, we have a returning guest. In episode 43, that was published almost a year ago, we had Robert McGuire. He's the founder of Nation 1099, an online resource for advanced freelance career advice and uh, businesses. So his publication talks about expands on the gig economy. So in the first interview we did, he ta- introduced us to the gig economy, what it means for the landscape. And what Robert has done recently is he's published a recent survey or data that he's collected from interviewing and studying the market. And he has some interesting stats to share with us about the freelance career freelance landscape or the gig economy itself. So I'm excited to hear more. Hey, Robert, welcome back to the podcast. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me on again. This is very exciting. Yeah, it's uh, my pleasure as well. I think when it comes to this subject, uh, you've done a very good job of constantly publishing great ideas, great insights, and now you have this survey. So I thought, you know, it would make sense to bring you back. I think you know the subject more than anybody else. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, I've been reading a lot of data. Hopefully I'll be able to provide some interesting insight. So before we jump into that, I know I already alluded that in my opening here or the, uh, I wanted to find out like, what have you been up to in the last year or so and what has changed in Nation 1099 since we last spoke? Yeah, well, as if folks who haven't heard that previous episode may not know, my day job is as a, as a freelancer. I am a marketing consultant who earns my living on a gig basis, and I have for many, many years, and that's grown into something, a, a substantial business and a steady career. And as I had a lot of questions about how to manage that business and become more entrepreneurial and creative about it, I was looking for information and not always finding the information I wanted, and that gave me the idea for a side project called Nation 1099. I know you are in Canada yourself and your listeners are all over the world, so you may not recognize the reference to 1099, which is the tax form that in the U.S., independent contractors use to report their income. So you can think of W-2s as people in traditional role-based jobs and 1099s as people in, who are doing gig-based work. So Nation 1099 is a resource for career and business advice for people who are really pretty experienced and further along in their freelance work. And that's, that's one update to Nation 1099. It started out kind of all over the place, any kind of advice for all comers who are in the gig economy. It's much more focused now on people who are really experienced and have established themselves and have proven that they can do their work and make a living at it, but they're trying to get to the next level. And so we provide pretty advanced and sophisticated advice for people who are a little bit further along in their freelance careers. And in some ways, I think your publication and mine as well, careermedis.com, complement each other, not, not meaning this to be a plug for career medis. <laughs> That's fine. What we focus on is like getting started in freelancing career, getting your first clients and how to get started, what others have done. And once they reach a certain level, your publication is is a great addition where they can talk about continuing that, building a career, earning more income, dealing with taxes and all that. So I think it goes hand in hand. And what I like about Nation 1099, it has got very niched and the advice there is very, very specific and you provide meaningful insights. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, as a marketing consultant, what I'm doing, like many other marketing consultants, is around content marketing. And I have some pretty firm convictions about what content marketing ought to do and what it not ought to do and what it should not do is just say the obvious and repeat what's already on Google. My theory, uh, what I always say to my clients is, you know, what I'm going to help you do is say something to your readers that is ungoogleable. that if they Google this subject, they're not going to find the answer to. That's the whole, Otherwise, why are we producing white papers and blog posts and everything for your website? And that's been my approach with Nation 1099 also. I don't want anything on there that anybody would know if they read the first five pages of Google. That's actually a great marketing tip. If any of your marketers listening to this, 
that it's great advice. So moving on to our conversation, Robert, last time we spoke, you were in the early stages of data, but now you've done an extensive uh, report. There's a survey, there's an infographic. So why don't you start us off with what you have learned in your research? Yeah, there are two resources in a way. What I did in, say, the year and a half after I was last on your podcast is really try to gather up all the existing data. So we have on our site what I think of as a literature review or a meta-analysis of all the existing surveys and studies and government data that we can find that touch in any way on the freelance workforce or the gig economy workforce. So you can think of those headlines that you frequently see that say one third of us are freelancers or half of us will be freelancers by a given date. All those studies that you see referenced all the time, we've got all those gathered up and synthesized and analyzed and dig deep down into the tables. And so there's that that folks can visit and that will give a pretty clear picture, as clear a picture as is possible about the freelance workforce. Because the truth is, even though I'm talking about say four or five dozen studies, compared to the data about the economy and the workforce in general, it is not a robust set of data. So the picture about the freelance workforce is still very fuzzy. But what's there, we have all vacuumed up and synthesized and sorted out. And then we did our own study last spring. Uh, We distributed a survey, a very short survey, with only about 10 or 15 questions on it. And where it was distributed was two freelancers in particular in networks where freelancers are actively looking for information to try and understand where they get information, what resources they need, what tools they still need, what they're looking for, what they're struggling with. And then we spent the summer analyzing the results and put out this report a couple months ago that I'm calling the Career Freelancer Status Report. So when your findings, you came across this term called career freelancers. Uh, tell, tell us more about that. At what stage does a freelancer become a career freelancer? Well, I guess whenever they make up their own mind, but You know, one thing that other studies have shown is that there's kind of a two-year startup period that most people, if they're going to make it, they start hitting their income goals after about two years. And the first couple of years is understandably a struggle. And you can think of it as very similar to a startup company. You know, startups don't, aren't profitable from day one generally. And so there was another study that showed that freelancers begin to hit their income goals after a couple of years. And then when you look at sort of attitudes about freelancers, More than 80% of them say they strongly prefer this way of working. More than 70% of them say they chose this way of working. So this is in contrast, I think, the traditional reputation about freelancers, which is that it's a euphemism for between jobs, meaning I got fired or laid off and I'm calling myself a freelancer until I find another job. That is just no longer the case. There's no stigma about it. People are definitely actively choosing this as a career, as a way of working anyway whether or not they intended as a long-term career. And more than half say they would not go back to a traditional role-based job at any price. And what's definitely happening is that the full-time freelance workforce in the U.S. is growing more than three times faster than the workforce overall. And there are a variety of reasons we can go into about that. What I'm finding in the report that we did is that freelancers who are actively looking for information, they've been doing it a surprisingly long time. So it, the people who are active in networks, active on Nation 1099, and this was distributed in a lot of places. The folks who are actively looking for information, this was probably the most surprising finding for me is the plurality, the biggest, the largest answer, the biggest group said, and that was 27%, said they'd been doing this for 10 years or more. And that if you bundle up everyone who said they've been doing it three years or more, that was 63% of respondents. So what I find interesting is when you were talking, Robert, one of the thoughts that came to my mind is in transition freelancer. You didn't call it that way, but in my short stint, when I worked at recruiting, one of the things I commonly saw in marketing and IT, people were laid off and they would be looking for a job and they definitely want full time, but they were willing to take a contract position to up their skills to give it a try or even as a means of making income. What you're saying is, what you found out is that is shrinking. More people are consciously looking into freelancing. That's right. The share of people, out of all freelancers, the the share of them who actively chose it is on the increase and the share of them who felt feel like they were forced into it unwillingly is on the decrease. And then what's also finding interesting, and this is not from our study, but from the others that I referenced that we synthesized, What's also interesting is that the folks that you're talking about are kind of pushed into it unwillingly or what they 
anticipate to be temporary, a growing number of them then discover they prefer it and, and don't go back. So there was one study, for example, from MBO Partners, and I want to give a shout out to some, a couple of other excellent studies, MBO Partners, and the other one is by Upwork and Freelancers Union. Both of those are done annually, so there's some good trend line data. The MBO Partner study looked at what happened after the 2008 financial crisis, and it, what they found was that it, freelancing increased partly for the reason you're describing. People lost their jobs. They got pushed unwillingly into the freelance economy. And then as hiring picked up, they did not return to full-time employment. So a significant number of people who go into it thinking it's going to be temporary while they're between jobs discover it as a career and don't go back. Yeah, that's interesting. So now because the things have changed, the economy is much better. All these people who, my speculation is all these people, as you said, they had to take it at that point. Now, if they like that whole lifestyle now, and they now full do that full time. Right, right. And so what we found in our analysis, our meta-analysis is that, and then again, this is US and we think it's something similar in the EU, is that if you look just at the folks who are full-time freelance, th so the numbers that you see in the headlines include um, people who are part-time and people who are very, very occasional, even people who uh, maybe only had 1099 income uh, contract income only once in the last year, they get counted in those big headline numbers that say a third of us are freelancers. If you sort it out to people who are really just act uh, full-time freelance in lieu of a traditional role-based job, it's about 11% of the U.S. workforce. That sounds like a much smaller number, but when you think about it, 11% of the U.S. workforce being full-time freelance means that self-employed as a group is bigger than any single employer in the U.S. It's bigger than the federal government bigger than the standing U.S. military, bigger than Walmart. So it's an enormous portion of the workforce. So you're talking about the, uh, depending on which statistics you look at in the U.S., the population is anywhere from 300, 350 million, so 11%, so more than 35 million people. Yeah. Are, and that's, that's almost as big as the population of Canada. That's interesting. That's very interesting. And what does that mean for the future of careers in your, I mean, what, what does this mean you also mentioned that people are consciously moving into full-time. I mean, I just wanted to get your input. In the next five years, what does 11% mean to you? Well, it, again, this group is growing three times faster than the workforce overall. What it, it means, it, there might be a natural cap to it. So what I think is their predictions about how much it's going to grow. If it keeps growing at, at the rate it's growing, then you know it's going to be 20% and then 25% and so on. I have a theory that Technology is enabling this growth and technology is releasing pent up demand, but the real driver of the growth is work life balance issues, a desire for more flexible work options and a desire for more remote work options. And employers are not providing those things as much as workers want them. The demand is greater than the supply for better work life balance, better, more remote work and more flexible work. So people are choosing freelance so they can create that themselves. It may be that we hit a natural cap that everybody who wants that, not everybody, but you know, everybody who wants that and who has the wherewithal to create a freelance career for themselves, they eventually all of those will be, be freelance. Technology will enable it and allow it, and it will hit some natural cap at some point. I don't know what the natural cap is going to be, but let's say it's 15 or 20 percent of the workforce. What that means on the employer side is what's really interesting to me, because if you are in a talent crunch, if you're an employer, if you're a recruiter or a talent manager or a human resources officer, and you have a talent crunch, that means that 11% of the prospective talent that you're looking for is not looking at job ads at all because they're not interested in working for you. They want to work with you on an independent contractor basis. So putting out job ads and job descriptions is like blowing a whistle that this population cannot hear. They don't have their antenna up for that kind of discussion with you. So you've got to start thinking in terms of projects and think in terms about how do I source and engage independent contractors if you are in a talent crunch. Okay. So you bring up a good point because it's a question I was meaning to ask. So we covered the landscape, we covered the growth. Where do freelancers find the work? In, in, in case someone is listening and saying, okay, this sounds good, but where do they, where do they go? Where do they find work? Is it a traditional job board like LinkedIn or do yeah. they do their own personal branding and people reach out to them? Yeah. What, uh, what other studies have shown, I, I was reading, rereading the MBO one again yesterday, and, it, it, and I'm going to forget the exact numbers, but it, in rough order was people are finding work through 
word of mouth and referrals through their former employers and then through online job boards. In our study, we had a couple of questions about the gig matching websites and which ones people use. And they were open-ended questions. It's basically like, do you use these? Which ones do you use? And if there were other job boards developed, what would make them useful for you? So if you didn't use them, you could just skip the question. You say, no, I don't use them to move on. But people did not skip the question. They paused and gave very colorful answers about why they do not use the job boards. So people are really, really frustrated with them, the gig matching websites, that is. And this kind of goes hand in hand with several other findings, which is that well, there was another finding about the salary that showed that the salaries, I shouldn't say that salaries, that the earnings for independent contractor income was plateauing after several years. The people got a good start, their income increased, and then the increase in income started to decelerate and they started to hit a plateau. So in general, what we found in the career freelancer report, status report, is that there's lots of great information and resources and job boards that are applicable to beginners and less that are applicable to people who are more experienced. So people are finding their jobs, finding freelance work primarily through word of mouth and referrals. And that is, to me, not sustainable. You can't scale. You cannot really grow your income. That's part of the reason people are plateauing because it's really difficult to scale through word of mouth and referrals. So this is interesting because you're saying that people are frustrated with the job, so-called gig matching websites or job boards. And I think that's common, right? Even if you're looking for a full-time career or you're just starting out, then at the same time, Word of mouth and referrals also is not sustainable. So what are the other options that are available to them to make them successful? Well, that's just it. I mean, this is an ecosystem that's just developing and just starting to, I mean, all kinds of services, whether it's help finding jobs, marketing your services, whatever, it's a immature ecosystem. So the answer is there aren't a lot. It's, it's hustle. I mean, people who are good at marketing, freelancers who are good at marketing themselves and good at sales. And I, I think there's an important distinction there. A lot of freelancers work in marketing because that's kind of the lowest barrier at entry. There are a lot of writers and copywriters who then become involved in marketing. So we're all maybe okay at marketing ourselves. Most of us are lousy at sales, but the folks who are good at marketing and sales are the ones who kind of keep growing and get entrepreneurial and figure out how to break through to the next level. A lot of freelancers are stalled at around the career freelancers who are doing this full time. They're kind of stalled at around 65,000 US dollars in their earnings and are not able to get past that point because the resources aren't there. Mm -hmm. Or the skills, I mean, whether it's resources or skills, like I say, a lot of us are not as good as we could be at business operations, at entrepreneurship, at business planning, and at sales. You know, I, I really like how the conversation is unfolding because the questions that I've been meaning to ask, you just bring it up in a natural flow <laughs> because we covered about how do they find a job. And you, you mentioned marketing and sales. And I, I believe, I'm a firm believer that's like, that's a skill, even if you're a job seeker, not a freelancer, it should apply. It's all about branding and marketing. So we spoke about that and you said some people are really good at that, some are not. So, I mean, you have been personally doing this yourself as well. What are your suggestions? How could they, if there isn't a set system or a place where they can go find opportunities and they had to rely on marketing and sales, what would be your suggestion so they can be successful on those areas? Well, part of it's mindset and seeing that it is a career, seeing that it is a business. It's kind of this weird hybrid, right? We, I mean, when you have a career, maybe you see it differently. In a way, you just said it is different. Like the traditional way of viewing a career is you get a job and then you do what your bosses tell you. You get promoted and, and you move up based on your aptitudes and skills and how hard you work and so on. And it, I think part of what Career Metis does is say, you know, you need to be more proactive and actively manage your career. Well, the same thing goes with freelancing. A lot of freelancers make the mistake of just treating it as time for dollars and they continue to treat it like an employer-employee relationship. Like I'm going to get, I'm going to see a call for a contract. I'm going to bid on that contract and get it. And then I'm just going to do what my client tells me to do. And they're not really proactive about their role in that. They don't negotiate. They don't brand themselves. They don't consider if this is the right contract for them. They don't take an entrepreneurial approach to figure out how to leverage this opportunity into other opportunities. And they really just let themselves fall into a kind of vendor mentality and where they get treated like a commodity. 
And the best case scenario there is you're sort of the best paid of all the commodities, but there's going to be a natural cap to that. So a lot of it is mindset and just realizing I need to take command of this situation and, and think in a strategic way and an entrepreneurial way about where the value is and how to position myself there. So the short answer is it's not only getting good at your core skills, whatever it is, is whether it's developer or yeah. writing or graphic design, it's also making sure you have these additional skills like the ability to sell yourself, manage your business. Yeah. So those are the things that will make you successful. You can't just rely on how good your technical skills are. It hardly matters at all. I mean, it matters, obviously. You need to be able to do what the, do the thing you do. But if that's the basis on which you're selling yourself, you are one of a million voices that the prospective client is hearing. Hundreds of other freelancers are selling themselves to your prospective client on the basis of cost, on the basis of skill, on the basis of working fast and working hard. All that stuff is table stakes and it's just white noise to the prospective client. You need to find another way to provide that, to signal to them that you're going to provide value. Okay. So the last question I have for you, Robert, today is in your experience, what are you seeing as the top within those 11% of freelance population in the US, which, which is a fast growing skill or a fast growing niche within that segment? Oh boy. We found that a third of our respondents were involved in copywriting or marketing in some way. Like I say, that is partly because it's the lowest barrier to entry, you know, in a laptop and an interconnect connection and you're set up as a copywriter. Part of it's due to history because publishing has always used freelance writers and editors as well as photographers and designers. And those are the other two areas that are the, where there's the biggest population. But those aren't necessarily the fastest growing. And they're not necessarily the most lucrative. My theory is always that what's happening in freelancing roughly parallels what's happening in the workforce in general. So the answer is probably, you know, in data analytics and AI and machine learning. So it's, you know, software engineering and web development are fast growing areas and lucrative areas. But you probably know that within those niches, some things are lower paying and being automated and treated as a commodity and some skills or some tasks within those industries are harder to find talent for. And I'm guessing it's in machine learning and data analytics and AI and things like that. And the same thing in marketing, right? You know, copywriting is not hard to find, but folks who understand marketing automation and are also good writers are hard to find. So it's really keeping up with the skills in your domain that is important. And to any talent managers out there listening, one of the studies definitely show, or several studies show, is that Overall, compared to the workforce at large, freelancers are more active at maintaining their skills, more active at paying attention to the economy, and more tech savvy and, and somewhat more educated in general. So if you're trying to fill a, a talent gap because a new skill has emerged and there just isn't anybody out there that, who has that skill, you're more likely to find it among independent contractors than you are out in the, among people looking for job opportunities. That's good. Hey, th those are great insights. Thanks, Robert. And there's a lot of information that was shared here. I appreciate you coming on board and sharing with us. Before I let you go, um, I just wanted to ask you a question. Like, what are some of the new things that you're working at Nation 1099? <laughs> where can people find you if they have more questions? Well, of course, where to find us is at nation1099.com. There's a contact form there. It's easy to reach me through that. The, probably the new thing, we have a weekly live stream show I call the Next Level Freelancing Advice Show every week. It's on a different theme. I find an expert on that theme and they give really practical advice. So for example, this last week it was on financial planning for freelancers, retirement and savings and all that. The week before it was about writing good contracts. We have stuff coming up on legal issues, on branding, on good web design to market your freelance business. So check out the Next Level Freelancing Advice Show. The place to find that is if you go, just go to nation1099.com and look for the videos link in the navigation. You'll find all our past and upcoming episodes there. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks everyone for listening to yet another episode of the Career Matters Podcast. I have written a brief summary of the interview with the links and resources that were shared during the interview. You can find that in the show notes. If you liked what you heard, feel free to subscribe to the Career Matters Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. And if you really enjoyed the episode and you felt you learned something new, 
feel free to post a comment or a review. Until next time, this is Nisar Ahmed, your host for the Career Matters Podcast. Thank you.